What is up guys, Seven O Savage here, coming at you today with a brand new episode of Seven O Savage University. Today we are gonna be covering how to build your own DIY 100% off-grid electrical system. Whether it's for your van, boat, RV, tiny home, or your spaceship if you're watching this in 2031, this video is going to be applicable for all of them. The video that you're watching right now is part one of a two-part series. In this one, we're gonna be covering the concept, and in part two, we're actually gonna be going out into the van and building the actual system. I know you might be tempted to just skip straight to part two, but I promise you, before you start plugging wires together and blowing stuff up, you're going to want to understand all of the concepts that we cover in this part. If you are new to the channel, we have been recently converting off-grid sprinter vans completely DIY, everything from the cabinetry to the aluminum framing to the water and electrical systems. So if you like making things, slap that subscribe button below because it makes me feel a lot better about myself. It also helps me bring you better content in the future. Also, before we get started, I have to provide a disclaimer that you need to be aware of the risks and dangers with doing anything electricity related. Last year, I made a very mediocre electrical video. I actually don't even recommend that you go watch it. And in the beginning of that video, I said, hire professional, don't do this yourself. I no longer agree with that, but be aware of the risks. I am not liable for any injury or harm to anything that you do. Alrighty, buckle your seatbelts. Let's get started. So diving straight in, on the screen right now is my electrical diagram for the electrical system I'm gonna be putting into the van. I'll be putting a link to the high resolution version of this diagram in the video description below. Lots of good stuff on that diagram if you look at the high res version rather than trying to stick your face closer to the screen on this video. Things like wire gauges on there, there's links to all the individual products on Amazon. So there's tons of wires on this thing, there's lines going everywhere. You're probably extremely overwhelmed by looking at this. Let's take a step back and focus on the big gray squares or rectangles, whatever. These four big squares represent the four different functions that any DIY off-grid electrical system is going to need. By the way, fun drinking game, every time that I say DIY off-grid electrical system, Take a drink. Of Pellegrino, of course, come on, what do you think we are here, alcoholics? These four functions, as I'm calling them, include the batteries or electrical storage, the charging devices, anything that creates energy that goes into your batteries, the 12 volt DC subsystem, and then the 120 volt AC subsystem. You actually don't need that last one there, all the 120 volt stuff, but it is really nice to have. Alrighty, so let's start with the very first section, electrical storage. Heads up, we are also going to be covering some terminology, which is part of the reason why this section is so long. Electrical storage really just means your batteries. In an off-grid system, it's typically easiest to buy either one 12-volt battery or multiple 12-volt batteries and connect them in parallel to create one 12-volt battery bank. When you are looking at batteries for off-grid electrical systems, they are rated by their amp hours, which refers to the total capacity of that battery. Now, when you buy multiple 12-volt batteries and connect them in parallel, you can take the amp hour rating for each battery and add them together to determine how many amp hours your entire battery bank has as a whole. Speaking of amp hours, this is when the terminology is gonna start getting really confusing. So I think we should dive in now to explain what each term means so that it's no longer confusing for the rest of the video. There are five terms you're gonna need to know as far as measurements for electrical systems. One of them is amps, which is different than amp hours. We have volts we have watts, and then we have watt hours. And just a heads up, this is gonna be a really abstract and simplified version of explaining these terms. So if you're some sort of rocket scientist or physicist, you're going to hate this section and you should just skip it. So the very first term that we're gonna start out with is the most important one, and it is watts. Watts are like the overall electrical power of any electrical circuit. The great thing about watts is they're like the baseline number for overall power. You can directly compare the overall watts of a 12 volt circuit, the watts of a 120 volt circuit, 
or the watts of some crazy powerful electrical system like a Tesla 48 volt circuit. Higher watts will always mean more power and lower watts always means less power. This is literally a law of physics. Speaking of laws of physics, you need to understand this equation right here. We are not gonna be getting into any sort of crazy math in this video, but this equation right here is necessary for you to understand how to build a DIY off-grid electrical system. Although watts are the overall power, you can tell from this equation that watts are composed from two different measurements. They are amps and volts. So amps measure the amount of current that's going through the wire or the speed at which the electrons are flowing through the circuit. And volts measure the density of electrons that are flowing in that circuit. So if you have a very high power circuit, it has a lot of amperage because the current is flowing very quickly and a lot of voltage, meaning there are a ton of electrons within each segment of that current flow. By the way, guys, full disclosure, I have awful animation skills. So you can kind of think of an electrical wire carrying electrons in a circuit similar to a conveyor belt carrying items from point A to point B. In our example, we are gonna have the conveyor belt carrying potatoes each potato is kind of analogous to an electron flowing through a wire. Why potatoes, you might ask? Well, because after this video, you're no longer gonna be one. So the speed of the conveyor belt is akin to the amperage that's going through the circuit, and the amount of potatoes that are on that conveyor belt are akin to the amount of voltage going through that circuit. In the spectrum of all of the different electrical systems that exist, our 12 volt off-grid electrical system is kind of like a conveyor belt with only a few potatoes on it because it only has 12 volts. And most of the time it's moving pretty slowly. Let's take a super simple example and create a circuit with just the battery and a light attached to it. In this case, we have a conveyor belt that still only has a few potatoes on it and it is moving very slowly. If we wanna speed that conveyor belt up, all we have to do is attach something that draws more power. Let's say we're attaching a 12 volt fridge that takes a lot more power than 12 volt lights. The circuit is still gonna be at 12 volts, but the amperage will increase in order to power that fridge. Therefore, we will have the conveyor belt with the same amount of potatoes on it that's moving quite a bit faster than the conveyor belt that just had the light. If we really wanna speed this thing up, it is pretty simple. All we have to do is attach the battery to itself. Now what happens in this situation is our conveyor belt speeds up to virtually infinite in a very short amount of time. Imagine there are just potatoes flying everywhere completely off of the conveyor belt, smashing into the walls. This is a common phenomenon called a short circuit. In real life, the wires that connect the circuit together would quickly melt and therefore be able to carry no more amperage. A short circuit is gonna happen anytime you have a positive wire that directly touches a negative wire. It can also happen when you make mistakes like dropping a wrench that touches both the battery terminals. I think most people who have worked on 12 volt systems have experienced that. Basically that metal wrench acts as a wire between the positive and negative terminal. So that sums up amperage. Now let's talk about volts. Imagine our same conveyor belt at 120 volts. The only thing that's changed is we now have more potatoes on this conveyor belt. Let's imagine our same simple circuit with nothing but a light bulb attached to it. Since this light bulb takes the same amount of power, but we're powering it with 120 volts, we have the exact same number of potatoes crossing the finish line. So our conveyor belt has to move much slower to deliver the same amount of potatoes. What this means in the real world is that you typically have lower amperage flowing through wires that are at 120 volts. Let's further simplify this circuit by taking the light out of the equation completely and directly attaching the positive to the negative. The exact same thing happens here where the conveyor belt starts going infinitely fast, but now we have 10 times the amount of potatoes flying around the room, smashing into people's faces. In the real world, a short circuit on a 120 volt system is much more aggressive than a short circuit on a 12 volt system. It's kind of like lighting one of those little sparkler sticks, except it hurts way more if it comes in contact with you. That covers amps and volts. Now back to our batteries, which were measured in amp hours. What's the difference between that and amps? A battery, with a certain amount of amp hours would be like a big tank full of potatoes that sits at the beginning of the conveyor belt. As far as electrical, if you're pulling one amp for X amount of hours, that's what the amp hour rating means. In real life, one amp is kind of like the amount of power it takes to power a few DC lights. So if all you're doing is powering a few lights that draw one amp in total, and you have a 100 amp hour battery, 
then you can power those lights for 100 hours before your battery goes to zero. In real life, that's not actually true because you can really only use about 80% of what the battery's rated at if you're using lithium batteries. Watts are basically just the multiplication of amps and volts, and watt hours are literally just the multiplication of amp hours and volts. So if we look at our original 100 amp hour 12 volt battery, which is a pretty common battery you find in a lot of different off-grid systems. You take the amp hours, which is 100, and you take the volts, which is 12, you multiply them, and therefore you have a 1200 watt hour battery. Now, does this put it into perspective when you look at something like a Tesla, which says it has a 100 kilowatt hour battery, which means it has a 100,000 watt hour battery. You'd need over 50 100 amp hour 12 volt batteries to compare to a Tesla battery. So as far as the very common question of how many batteries do I need for my off-grid electrical system? Well, you need to calculate how many amp hours of power you're going to be using on a daily basis. And you need at least that many amp hours of batteries so that you can store at least one day's worth of power that you'll use. And instead of calculating all of that in amp hours, I do recommend you calculate it in watt hours since we're going to have both a 12 volt and 120 volt system. It is so silly to me that our industry uses amp hours because a 100 amp hour two volt battery has way less capacity than a 100 amp hour 12 volt battery. So I apologize we had to kick off with the terminology. That's literally the hardest part to understand about off-grid electrical systems. So feel free to watch that part twice. But from here on out, it is all downhill. It is way easier. Let's move on to section two. Now that we have our battery bank, we have electricity stored that we can use to power all of our 12 volt devices directly. The naive way to power a 12 volt device, let's take something simple like a 12 volt light, would be to connect it directly to the positive and negative terminals of your battery, which you can totally do. Light will turn on and everything will work fine. And this actually technically qualifies as a off-grid electrical system. Oh my God, wow. But uh, trust me, we still have a lot more to cover. <laughs> Got he. Now the reason you wouldn't want to do this when you're actually making your off-grid system is kind of related to what we talked about earlier with the potential of short-circuiting. We've kind of agreed as human beings that it's a pretty bad situation when you come across a short circuit. We as humans have also come up with a good solution for this predicament. That solution is called a fuse or a breaker which is just a resettable fuse. If we look back at our super simple circuit with just the light, it wouldn't take much for this to become a short circuit. Let's say that our simple light bulb circuit is in a van. It's very common for the wires to rub up against the metal of the van, which goes through the insulation and can easily cause a short circuit. You could have rats chewing on your wires in a tiny home. All sorts of things can happen out on the ocean. At the end of the day, a short circuit is always something that can happen. The idea is you put a fuse on the wire that's way lower than the amount of amps that would flow through that wire and cause it to melt. Whereas if you didn't put a fuse there and there was a short circuit, so much current will flow through that the wire will melt, there will be sparks, it will not be fun. Exact same thing with a breaker, but if a breaker trips, you can just reset it with your fingers rather than ordering a new fuse. So let's take this concept of fuses and put a new component into our off-grid system, which is a 12 volt fuse box. So since every 12 volt DC device is gonna be connected to this 12 volt DC fuse box, we have to make a decision on what size fuse to use in each location. Thankfully, we've already covered amps. You wanna use a fuse that's a little bit bigger than the amperage your device draws. Let's take our set of lights that draw one amp all together. We could just use a two amp fuse. For something like my fridge that draws 18 amps, I would probably use a 20 amp fuse. As long as you use a fuse that's a little bit bigger than you expect that device to draw, your fuse will not blow under normal operations. If there's a short circuit or there's a problem, the fuse will blow before the wire melts, which is definitely a good thing. At this point, we are safe to add all of our 12 volt devices to the system and our diagram looks a little bit like this. One more thing we need to add to this diagram for things like lights, things like the water pump is a switch. We wanna be able to turn these things off when we're not using them. Switches are very simple. They literally intercept the positive connection in your circuit. So if you have a wire coming from the positive side on that fuse box, you connect that wire to a switch. And then on the other side of that switch, you connect it to the device. 
So when you flip the switch, it breaks the circuit completely. The dimmer switches that we're gonna be using for the lights are kind of the same concept, just as you twist them, it's regulating how much voltage is allowed to pass through that wire. At this point, you're probably asking, well, how do I know what size wire to use for all of these DC devices? Since we've covered amps and we've covered fuses, wire sizing is gonna be extremely easy. All you need for the wire is the smallest wire you can get away with that won't melt. Instead of testing that out for each device and learning the hard way, there are charts available like this one from Blue Sea that shows you how long of a distance your circuit is, how many amps are gonna be flowing through that circuit, and then tells you exactly which wire gauge you need to pick. So for our lights that are gonna draw roughly one amp and it's gonna be about 30 feet total round trip of that circuit, you have to include the length of the positive wire and the length of the negative wire. We can look at this blue C chart and see that we need to use 12 gauge wire. Now this chart's a little bit confusing because there's a critical column and a non-critical column. I would definitely lean towards critical for everything. People always ask, well, this recommends 12 gauge, but what if I go all the way to two aught gauge, right? A massive, super thick wire. This right here is a spool of 12 gauge wire. It's actually three cables all in one sheath. And this beast is two aught cable. So that's the difference in size. If you really wanted to, you could just use two aught cable for your lights rather than this 12 gauge. You're not gonna have any problems with that, but this stuff costs way more and it's way heavier per foot than the 12 gauges. By the way, wire gauges are really confusing in themselves because the higher the number, the smaller the wire. An 18 gauge wire is way smaller than a one gauge wire. Once again, I do have all the wire gauges that I'm gonna use on the high definition version of this wiring diagram that you can download from the video description below, but run your own calculations, guys. On any device that you're buying, it shows you how many amps it's pulling, or it shows you how many watts it takes. If it shows you how many watts, just divide it by 12 volts, and you have the amperage that it pulls and plug it into this chart. And that actually covers all of the 12 volt DC stuff. We can now safely connect any of the 12 volt devices and we'll be good to go. The reason you might want both 12 volt DC devices and 120 volt AC devices is a lot of things simply don't run off of 12 volt DC power. Stuff like the outlets in your homes and anything that plugs into them, those are all 120 volt. You'll need to understand this section of the video if you want those outlets or you wanna power anything that takes 120 volt AC. There are a lot of similarities between 120 volt AC systems and 12 volt DC systems. Things like choosing what size your fuses are, choosing your wire size are exactly the same, but there are also some pretty big differences. First big difference, obviously your batteries don't output 120 volt AC. So we need to figure out how to convert the 12 volt DC power that our batteries make into 120 volt AC power. The way that you do that is with a device called an inverter. Inverters come in a bunch of different sizes and they're rated based on their wattage. That wattage refers to the overall power that they can convert from your batteries to usable AC power. The smallest inverters are in the hundreds of watts and the largest inverters are in the thousands of watts. The way to determine what size of inverter you need depends on how many AC devices you need to run at the same time and how much power each one of those AC devices takes. It's important to note that you probably don't need to run all of your AC devices simultaneously and get an inverter that can power all of them. Bigger, more powerful inverters are more expensive, so you wanna get the smallest size that you can get away with. Let's say you have a microwave that takes roughly 1,000 watts, and then you have a water heater, which also takes roughly 1,000 watts. If you decide that you need to run both of those at the same time, you're going to need at least a 2,000 watt inverter. If you want to be running all of those and also plug something like a coffee maker in simultaneously, you're gonna need to go even higher above 2000 watts to like a 3000 watt inverter. Now you might decide that you don't need to run all of those at the same time, you only need to run one of them. And if that's the case, then you can get away with simply a 1000 watt inverter. And in that case, if you try and turn on too many devices, the inverter will just shut off and you'll lose power to everything. It's not that big of a deal, you could just turn it back on, but you won't be able to run all of those devices for very long before the inverter simply gives out. The next big difference between 120 volt AC versus 12 volt DC is that 12 volt DC uses two wires, the positive and negative we've been talking about to this point, whereas 120 volt AC actually uses three wires. 120 volt AC has a hot wire, a neutral wire, and a ground wire. They're usually indicated by black, white, and green respectively. 
You'll also see 120 volt AC wires as red, black, and green for hot, neutral, and ground. This is the way that I prefer to indicate hot, neutral, and ground in 120 volt off-grid systems because it just mentally maps better to the 12 volt DC one. For our purposes, the hot and the neutral kind of create a circuit similar to the positive and the negative. That green ground wire is just a safety precaution. It doesn't carry any current unless there's a short circuit on that part of the system. I'm not gonna get too in depth as to how AC power actually works. What we need to know for our system is that we connect the hot, neutral, and ground wires from the output side of the inverter to the input side of our device. So all 120 volt AC devices have three wire inputs and your inverter will have three wire outputs. The cheaper inverters, like typically anything under a thousand watts, won't have actual hot, neutral, and ground terminals, but they'll have actual outlets on that inverter that you simply plug your devices into. Now, just like the 12 volt DC subsystem, we don't wanna connect the output of our inverter directly to the devices unless you have a small one and you're plugging it in, that's okay. If you have a larger inverter, like the one that we're using, you wanna have a layer of fuses in between the output of the inverter and the devices. This is exactly the same concept as we did with our DC fuse box, except this time we are going to use a 120 volt AC panel is what they call it. These are more expensive than the 12 volt DC fuse boxes and they typically support way fewer devices, but the concept is exactly the same. We're gonna take the three output wires from our inverter, connect them to the three input wires on the AC fuse box, and then each one of our devices is going to be connected individually to one location on that that AC fuse box. Once again, choosing your wire sizes and your fuse sizes on this 120 volt AC subsystem are exactly the same calculation as the 12 volt DC system where we're looking at the amperage that our devices use. The difference here is that it's 120 volts and not 12 volts. So if you have a device that pulls 1200 watts and it's a 120 volt AC device, then it's only pulling 10 amps. Whereas a DC device that pulls 1200 watts would be using 100 amps. Remember volts times amps equals watts. That covers everything that we need to know to hook up our entire 120 volt subsystem. All of our 120 volt devices now work. Let's move on to the next section. The last section in this video is covering chargers. When I say chargers, I'm referring to anything that generates power that's going to be stored in your batteries. The four most common ways that us off-gridders generate power are solar panels, shore power, a DC to DC charger, and then the last one, number four, is a gas or diesel generator. The reason we're covering this section last is because some of those chargers I just mentioned generate DC power, and some of those chargers generate AC power. Let's start with the two DC power generating devices, the solar panels and the DC to DC battery charger. The first question that everybody asks when it comes to solar is how many solar panels do I need? Thankfully, now that we understand the terminology behind electricity, we can calculate this pretty easily. Solar panels are measured in watts, which refers to how many watts they generate. Watt hours are just the amount of watts that are generated for X amount of hours. If you have a 100 watt solar panel that's generating the full 100 watts while the sun is out for five hours, you have 500 watt hours in total that that solar panel has generated. The thing is solar panels almost never generate the full amount of watts that they're rated for even when the sun is out. So you are going to have to do some research to figure out how much power the panels that you want actually generate on a sunny day. To make this super simple, you're trying to generate just as much power or more than the amount of power that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you know the amount of watt hours that you're going to use on a day-to-day -day basis, then you need to have the amount of solar panels that are gonna generate those same amount of watt hours. If you're in a small vehicle like a boat or a van, you're gonna realize that the limiting factor is actually the amount of roof space that you have. In those situations, it's really easy to calculate how many solar panels you need because because you get as many as you can fit on your roof. The thing about solar panels is they don't generate good, clean power that can be pumped directly into your batteries. You need what's called a solar charger or a solar controller to convert the power that your solar panels are generating to something that your batteries 
like. You're going to want an MPPT solar charger as those are gonna make your solar panels much more efficient. As far as how big of a solar controller you need, feel free to Google that one. A Little bit too in depth for what we're covering right here. All we need to know for this video is you have your solar panels, which are connected to the solar controller or solar charger, which are connected to your battery. I like to put a breaker on each side of the solar controller in case there's a short between the solar panels and the controller, or if there's a short between the solar controller and the batteries, we're safe either way. The next 12 volt charging accessory is the DC to DC charger. You're gonna be using this if you're in an RV or a boat, any sort of vehicle that has an alternator that charges a battery. This is effectively alternator charging, not officially because there is a way to connect your house battery directly to the alternator's output. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the simple DC to DC charger. You connect one positive and one negative wire from that charger to your car battery and the other positive and negative on that charger to your house battery. And when you turn that charger on, it pulls power from the car battery and charges your house battery. Super, super simple. You wanna get the biggest DC to DC charger that the car battery can support as far as discharge rate. So if you have like a lead acid car battery, which is what most people have, you really don't wanna go above 40, 50 amps. We're pushing it a little bit on this van with a 60 amp DC to DC charger. If you do happen to have a lithium car battery, well, then you can draw a lot more amperage from that. That covers it for DC chargers. Now let's cover the 120 volt AC chargers. The first one and the most common one by far is shore power. That means you're plugging in your off-grid system to the grid and pulling power from the grid, whether that be at a marina, an RV park, somebody's house. The power on the electrical grid in the USA is 120 volt AC power, the exact same power that your inverter outputs, which probably makes a lot more sense why they have inverter chargers. If you buy a larger inverter, typically above a thousand watts, you can typically also buy what's called an inverter charger, which allows you to plug shore power into your inverter and converts it back into DC power and charges your batteries. If you're going to be using shore power, I recommend you just get an inverter charger rather than just an inverter. If you've already made that decision and you have your inverter that's not an inverter charger, you can buy a separate battery charger that takes in 120 volt AC power and converts it to 12 volt DC power charge your battery bank. The way that you actually wire this up, there are three terminals, a hot, neutral, and a ground on your inverter that you connect a receptacle to that looks like an outlet with just one plug. You'll typically put that on the outside of your boat or your RV, and you can plug your shore power wire into that, charging your batteries. Even more straightforward is the generator. So from the perspective of our electrical system, shore power and generator are exactly the same thing. Either one of those is gonna go through the exact same receptacle that you mount to the outside of your vessel. It's gonna go through your inverter and charge your batteries. And that covers everything that we need to know for chargers. Now there is one extra section that I wanna cover here. I'm just gonna call this section extras. These are also really important things that you need to know that you'll need for your system, but they didn't really cleanly fit into any of the other sections we previously covered. As we start building a more and more complex electrical system with more things connected directly to the batteries, for our example here, we have the inverter connected to the batteries, we have our 12 volt DC fuse box connected directly to the batteries, and then the charging mechanisms are gonna be connected directly to the batteries as well, some of them, not the 120 volt ones. It starts getting very unwieldy to connect multiple things to a battery terminal. I'd say once you start connecting more than two things to a single battery, that's what the purpose of bus bars are for. You take your battery bank and you attach it to one positive bus bar and one negative bus bar, and now you have six or seven different terminals that represent the positive and negative on your battery bank, and it is the more safe way to go about things. Next thing I wanna cover is a battery monitor. This is what's going to let you see the percentage of battery you have left in your battery bank or the state of charge. Battery monitors are pretty similar to the rest of your 12 volt DC devices. The biggest difference is that a battery monitor will have a device on it called a shunt. You need to hook this shunt up between your negative bus bar and the negative terminal on your battery. It's the only connection between those two things. The shunt becomes the very last component that electrons are flowing through in our circuit. And what the shunt does is it counts the amount of electrons that are going through it so that we can determine how much we've pulled from our batteries. The battery monitor is a separate device than the shunt and the shunt needs to transfer its electron count to 
the battery monitor. The way that that works is with a data cable, you literally just plug one into both sides. Other than that, the battery monitor is a regular 12 volt device that just has a positive and negative. The more expensive, nicer battery monitors like the Victron one I have in my diagram will actually give you a Bluetooth app that connects to the device showing your battery percentage, how many amps you're drawing, and all sorts of other data that you could possibly want on your batteries. The next extra concept that I wanna cover, which you may have been wondering this entire time if you've been doing additional research prior to watching this video, is your system ground. The concept of grounding your battery bank to either the chassis of your vehicle or to an actual ground location in a tiny home. On a lot of the devices that you'll buy, they'll refer to the negative as the ground and vice versa. On the 12 volt side, literally anything that refers to ground or negative both mean connected to the negative terminal on the battery bank. And by negative terminal of the battery, I don't literally mean the physical negative terminal of the battery. It just has to make its way back to the negative terminal of the battery. So if it's like the negative bus bar or the negative side of the 12 volt fuse box, that counts. This is all because we've created what's called a floating system where the current of this system flows through all of the wires that we've added to it. Our floating system is different than OEM car manufacturers. We don't have to worry about that for now. For our system, it's fully floating and self-contained. It is definitely a good idea to ground your battery bank directly off the negative terminal of your battery to a grounding location. In my van, I'm gonna ground it to the chassis, but there shouldn't be any current ever flowing through that ground. And that covers everything we need to cover for you to conceptually understand how to build an off-grid electrical system. I know we covered a ton in a very short amount of time. Do not feel bad if you have to watch this video multiple times. It takes time for your brain to process this stuff and understand it. At risk of your brain exploding into a baked potato, I'm gonna wrap this video up quick. Just kidding, now that you've watched this video, you're no longer a potato, you've graduated to an asparagus, which is a much more sophisticated vegetable. First thing I wanna say make sure to watch part two of this video which will answer a ton of the questions that have to do with applying these concepts to actually putting wires together. Part two is going to connect a lot of the dots. If you did learn something from this video, my request is that you pay it forward by slapping the subscribe button below and clicking the like button below so that the YouTube algorithm will push this video out to more people who can learn the same things that you just did. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and I will see you you guys next time.